So I have prepared kind of a very formal talk. Sorry for you because it's a bit late in the day, but here I go. So uh, first of all, I want to thank, I have to thank actually, the Oscar Uchune Foundation in Finland that has awarded me a fellowship to be in Cambridge. And I also want to thank, of course, John for inviting me so generously to this incredible city. I am very amazed by this city. And uh, so I will talk about my work in progress on natural rights. So I am learning while, while I am researching. So perhaps some of you will totally disagree with that, with the I'm talking. I am open to be challenged. I would, would be grateful. So I will divide the talk in two parts. First is an introduction describing relevant aspects of the historiography uh, of natural rights and human rights, actually, a little bit. And in the second part, I will make a historical argument on the uses of natural rights in the early history of international law. So recently, uh, John Tassiolas uh, was asked to give five books, five relevant books on human rights. And he mentions uh, uh, Brian Tierney's The Idea of Natural Rights, uh, one of the five, which is already 20 years old by now. So the reasons that Tassiolas gave to for his choice is that Tierney superseded the argument famously made by Michel Villet that natural rights were born as an expression of individualist nominalism in the early 14th century. So in particular, um, Villet thought that they came, they were born through the work of William of Ockham, the theologian. So and Tierney criticized Villet ferociously. Ferocity. So further, he clearly proposed his own argument that the natural rights appeared earlier in the works of canon lawyers and uh, trying to reconcile Roman law and canon law uh, norms. So from an understanding of, of use as what is just, um, there a shift happens towards a conception of use as something, like as a capability, like a power, a faculty that individuals possess. So in that sense, Tierney attempted to the link natural rights from metaphysics. So the argument by Villet had been that law always follows metaphysics. And that from an Aristotelian objective um, natural law emerging in the 13th century, importantly through Aquinas, uh, we entered through, by Occam's hands into a nominalistic metaphysics where natural rights thrived. So Tierney said to this, no, natural rights appear rather simply as tools, as moral tools, no doubt, but they appeared in a feudal world uh, endowing the individuals with value, and they were um, tools devised by canon lawyers describing the foundation of some actions of rational human beings. Uh, so certainly Tierney's research was absolutely groundbreaking, bringing to the attention of people the canon law. I don't know if, any, if you still know what is canon law, it's the law of the Catholic Church, at least uh, in that period. Uh, but also Michel Villet's project was very groundbreaking. So after them, for instance, uh, Annabelle Brett or Birby Mackinen have, and several other people have written, but not many other people, have written monographs on natural rights contextualize the natural rights. So my approach to natural rights is that they are uh, like keys or codes that help to grasp deep intellectual currents going on in a very large period of European history. So as probably in a couple of centuries people might uh, try to understand where did human rights came from, what was their political and moral function. So I am aware that now in this moment, contemporary people like Lynn Hunt, Samuel Moyne, or Stefan Ludwig Hoffmann are giving accounts on why did human rights appear. So Samuel Moyne has very successfully claimed that human rights in the West, in their current sense, uh, arose in the 1970s from the ashes of the process of decolonization. So for Moyne, human rights are recent, these are his words, and contingent. So I was lucky enough to be two weeks ago in a, in a debate at the Lotterbach Center between Samuel Moyne and Payam Akaban. 
And I had the impression that he, in his new book, uh, Samuel Moyne will be even more critical, but also more engaging into a study of what human rights are. In, in this sense, what I'm talking about, like as codes or keys, explaining important things of current political uh, thinking. So then, uh, Stefan Ludwig Hoffmann, in an article in the summer 2016, Human Rights and History, links the contemporary characterization of human rights as individual, I'm quoting him, pre-state and concerned primarily with distant suffering, with the ethical turn of the 1990s that occurred in political philosophy, sociology, as well as in law and politics. So accordingly, Hoffman calls in his article for um, the history of human rights to be, I'm quoting, expanded to include a moral history of the century after the Enlightenment. Lynn Hunt, uh, uh, on, the, uh, on her part, in the uh, book Inventing Human Rights and History, also engages with the human concerns that human rights are designed to address. So her book attributes the unfolding of human rights during the late 18th century to the appearance of a new emotional regime and an imagined empathy with the suffering of our fellow human beings. So looking for anthropological basis on human rights, these two works uh, are currently rare historical projects with the discipline, within the discipline of human rights. So I agree with Hoffman's proposal that human rights can be legitimately studied as emerging from within the moral disciplines, but I do not share his slightly too innocent or harmless focus on distant suffering. So with regard to Moyne's program of historicization of the notion of human rights in their current sense, it involves both an ambition to settle the question of what current human rights are, and a projection of a current legal concept into the past in order to declare that that thing did not exist before. So the result of his endeavor is enlightening. However, at least in Human Rights, The Last Utopia, it leaves the reader with a certain uh, feeling of incompleteness. Surely a study of a notion that is so intimately connected with the morality of the human being cannot, be close, cannot close over the aspect of morality. So the suggestion of Anne Orford that in law and other disciplines one acquires greater enlightenment about human society and human beings from following the thread of history seems helpful. So in this respect, one can add to the debates about the importance of contextual history that over-contextualization involves the danger of uh, relativism. And also, as also, of course, Koskinini has already <laughs> written about that in his article, Victoria and Us. So, and uh, so this relativism might miss kind of relevant aspects of human life that we, we don't want to miss and we want to understand. So ultimately the issue at the stake is whether or not past and present share some epistemological, political and moral ground. And in the particular case of the history of human rights, uh, the question I would, I, uh, I would like to make is why, why, when did natural rights metamorphosed into human rights, and what changed it, and, and what uh, pre uh, remained. So in fact, <clears throat> the buoyant character of natural rights uh, proves the, the, this theory of continuity. So still today, some of those seeking to, for the nature of human rights, fearless of their anti-essentialist environment, looked, look at natural rights coming back again to Giotto, Giotto Tassiola's uh, orthodox, orthodox state. So this, he, he, he is a very good example of that. No? He talks about the moral natural rights as being the nature of human rights. And also, for instance, Carl Wellman, uh, he refers his attempt of grounding human rights in natural rights theory to Hoffel, the book of, by Hoffel, Fundamental Legal Concepts. But the if one sees that the Hoffelian language, like about claims, liberty, powers, the amazing thing is that it bears an astonishing resemblance to the term terminological distinctions of natural rights that the 13th century theologians uh, use. So probably he's also a theologian. Mm -hmm. So the recent, his the recent history of international law we witnessed also distinguished attempts of founding the emerging international movements of human rights in the tradition of natural rights. 
One may recall that uh, international legal positivism received a great impetus from Lassa Oppenheim, a German Jewish emigre, naturalized a British citizen, professor at the newly established London School of Economics and then at the University of Cambridge. So his main argument in the early 20th century that made him famous was that, was that we are done with natural law and with natural rights. Now that, that was, I'm quoting him, something for the museum, for the museums like fossils. Very interesting. Oh wow, this is what Europeans did. That's very nice in the museum. So uh, for him uh, and for a whole generation of intellectuals, the world needed now only facts and positive law. No? So, but this attitude was drastically reversed in the mid 20th century by an Austrian Galician Jewish emigre, Hesch Lauterbach, who tried to buttress the, the foundations of international law after two world wars, the failure of the minority treaties and the minority protection treaties, sorry, and the unthinkable phenomenon of the Nazis. So Lauterbach, he has a, quite a, a great resemblance, his biography with Oppenheim, he also went to the London School of Economics and then he uh, got the chairing of international law at the University of Cambridge. But he has this different turn of things, no? So, um, so he's a very, Lauterbach is a very rich figure, full of contradictions, arguably both a positivist, student of the great Hans Kelsen, and a natural lawyer at the same time. So how can you do that? He did that. So he was invited in April 1942 by the American Jewish Committee to write a book on international law and human rights. And Philip Sands uh, writes that in that book, Lauterbach attempted to shift the center of uh, international law from, from the states being the center to individuals becoming the center. And in order to support that effort, philosophically, Lauterbach pushed the recovery uh, of a tradition of natural rights, underlining the historical continuity within the history of international law. So first natural law, then law of nations, and then international law. And also he highlighted the inspirational order that natural rights could provide, in his words, as a standard of its approximation to justice. So, um, we have, with, we have with this a, a conscious move by one of the best international lawyers of the 20th century uh, to assert the importance of natural rights. So in a sense, natural rights are depicted by the lot of as an ideal order in which to search for inspiration. And the value, valuable feature that he highlights is a, that they were, had been always a, a source of progress. And actually, it is. It is like that, but we shall see later. So Lauterbach's uh, project, with his not completely disingenuous move of trying to inject the progressive natural rights um, into the foundation of human rights before everyone else would inject other things, um, illustrates nicely uh, the richness of the study of epistemological continuities in the history of international law. At any rate, continuations can show how larger political projects operate. To trace a continuation can show how a larger political project operates. So admittedly, Lautbach stood quite a lot in that position of, of uh, pushing for natural rights. He was also fiercely criticized, for instance, by Morgenthau. So in the end, we can say Oppenheim won. And nowadays, natural rights sound to international lawyers like something from the Middle Ages probably, or about virtues when people still believed in God, or, or something that died out of the latest in the American Revolution. So I have made a, a survey in, in the college where I'm living there in Cambridge, and 50% of the persons have never heard the word. So to put it bluntly, mainly the lawyers have heard even the concept. So perhaps you even heard about it. So to, I, I can give you kind of rough numbers. No? So, like roughly 50%, because there you have to explain, what do you do? I do, ah, I work with natural rights. No? So, I'm, and 50% of the people put up face like, wow. Uh, what is this? No? So, they, they really never had the notion or, of the idea or the principles that are behind that. No? So, another minor section, like, let's say, kind of, 
15% or so, uh, knew, knew what, what are natural rights. I'm talking still about the people in my college. But they, they immediately, when you say, I'm researching natural they they retort it, but there are no natural rights. So they have a very strong position against natural rights. And then another group, also like, say, 15%, they say, yes, yes, I know this. These, these are rights given by God. And so and that type of answer has been also interesting. And the fourth group, a tiny, tiny group of the most super, uh, really the, the most, how do you say that in English, the most educated, so to say. No? They remember the name of Cicero in the context of natural rights. No? So you can, now we make an exercise. Everyone in the room can think, which answer? Would I have known what are natural rights? But you don't need to, to say. So that, that is so that you relax a little bit. So, so it would be tempting to divide these, these four groups that I have just mentioned, these four groups of answer into four types of attitudes towards religion. No? For the first, agnostic, no? no idea and no interest in anything resembling something that is kind of beyond the empirical. No? So these are the scientists, so to say. No? Then the second group, the non-believers, those who say that no natural rights. Then the third group, believers, yes, there are natural rights. And the fourth group, the, the classicists. No? Natural rights are kind of before religion, or at least before Christian religion. So as you have noticed, I have introduced uh, the notion of religion, mainly because one of my findings is that natural rights are connected to religion in, in a very complex and not obvious way at all. So, but I can already disclose the end of the story that, divi that the division believers, natural rights, non-believers, non-natural rights is inaccurate. But still, natural rights are connected to religion, which um, in a, um, so, okay. And th they were born within a theological, theological intellectual discourse. So my experience also in, in, in the college, this little experience that I have shared with you, also has helped me to confirm that the huge topic of natural law and natural rights uh, is this totally under, under research area. And, and hence for us it is blurry and dark and we tend to do many unconscious connections and assumptions. Uh, and all this lack of clarity and ambiguity is there despite the fact that several impor important aspects of the European are Western intellectual and political theory uh, derived and have developed on the foundation of natural rights. So you probably know about the critical literature about human rights, and so within the discipline of international law, many criticize to the human rights, despite that at the outset uh, they are kind of good-looking notions. No? Uh, so, but cri critics think or thought, for instance, like Oppenheim, that natural rights, human rights, are an antiquity not pragmatic or simply they are too political, ineffective. But also we have the opposite critique, that they are so political that they are very efficient, means to achieve Western imperialist or capitalist goals. So on the whole, what is constant in, in my view is what I have uh, just mentioned, that the confusion surrounding uh, the understanding of uh, notions such as natural rights and human rights. I think this is the thing that is really constant, the confusion. And I would argue that one of the key reasons to foster and provoke the confusion is this vague and ambiguous relationship of natural rights with the religion and uh, with religion and with the ethical good. So in the first place we no longer know how to talk about God in or about religion in law. As a famous professor used to say to his students, in modernity, we have put God under the table. So the second reason is that historiog the historiography of international law, often have inc included, has consistently written that the birth of the sovereign European state occurred on the foundation of the secularization of the European order after the peace of the Spire. So the narrative is that when international law started, religion disappears from the European legal order after the famous Oxford formula for the empire of 1555, cuius regio eius religion, in a princess country, the princess religion, every sovereign has a real religion, but international law and the international realm are now secular. 
So this is the narrative. However, if you remember, I just said that Lars Oppenheim in the beginning of the 20th century uh, was fighting natural law and natural rights. So it must have been at least alive then. Interestingly, uh, I think that both the historiography of international law and the positivists are right. So international law is very secular, and at the same time, a quasi-religious natural law keeps cropping everywhere, at least until the late 19th century, or early 20th century. And after the World War II, natural rights entered through the front door of international law in the form of human rights, that is uh, written down in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So this paradox is reproduced in the natural rights idea. So in the second part, which will be a bit more historical, I hope to show this curious nature of natural rights, the general space, both divine and secular, progressive and conservative. And I will do that by showing the manner in which they were employed uh, by the so-called founders of international law. So let's go for the founders. So the theologian jurist Francisco de Vitoria in the 16th century, founder of the school of Salamanca, and the Dutch Jewish theologian Hugo Grotius in the 17th century are customarily considered fathers of international law. In the 19th century, Protestant historiography centered on Hugo Grotius, and in the 20th century, the new American universalism also recovered the teachings of the School of Salamanca, and especially of Vittoria. So I have found like six common elements between Vittoria and Grotius. In, the, in, his, in their understanding of the emerging law of nations. So first, they imagine not only, uh, they imagine certain Roman law norms that could be universally applied, but then the second element is the, their appraisal for the first time of a global community, so a natural society. Well, in the Latin words of Vittoria, naturalis societatis et comunicaciones. So in this natural society of partnership and communication is a partnership that also Grotius accepts. And Grotius enlarges it with more scriptural uh, arguments. So he also says, for instance, that unbelievers are fellow men and we can contract alliances with them, etc. So these, are these two elements. Then uh, the third element is uh, lots of theology. Of course, they were theologians. And the uh, fourth element is that's why I'm bringing them here, is that they, they uh, employ natural rights as a foundational element in their natural law project, and they use it identically. So it, in both of them, the role of natural rights in the argument is logically the same. Uh, so, and apart from natural rights, uh, the fifth element is that both deal systematically with the laws of war, and the sixth element that I have found is that uh, both the work of Victoria Grotius revolves around the central question of, and the, at the moment of foreign relations, which is the protection of the roots of trade. So trade with the West Indies uh, in America for Victoria and trade with the East Indies in Asia. So in the case of Victoria, the threat to a smooth trade flow are the Indians. So I'm using here the Indians in a kind of academic sense, so please no one uh, feels uh, offended. But I see the sources say Indians. So. Okay. And so the threats to the smooth trade flow are the Indians. While for Grotius, the danger are not the native, but the Portuguese and the Spaniards. So the very Europeans are the threat. So we can first start with uh, Victoria, what he said about natural rights. No? So, you know, you know a little bit about Victoria? The basis, something. The name at least? Yes. Okay. So, he was a humanist, uh, and often the historiography of international has praised him as being the protector of the Indians, of the newly discovered America. So, famously so in, his, in, in, in a lecture he gave, uh, published later as Relative the Indians. So the actual main content of the relate to the Indies was the description of the argumentation of the illegitimate titles for the Spaniards to be in America, and also the legitimate titles. So, and he has been portrayed as a defender of the Indians because kind of two-thirds of the text 
uh, are uh, this, uh, reserved to putting forward arguments describing the un un unlawful titles of the Congress. So, and these are kind of the, that counts as the defense of the Indians. So he said, for instance, that the emperor, the emperor had no title over the world, the pope had no title over the world that he could hand it over to the Spaniards. So despite being pagans, the Indians were true masters of their territories and true owners of their goods. Therefore, one cannot just go there and grab their, their goal. No? So, so it is interesting also to know that when Victoria removes from the discourse on the Indians every possible authority, the imperial, the pope, even God, he's also eliminating these authorities from a conception of the law of nature. So the question that Victoria is posing or posing the Indies had been tirelessly debated in, in Castilla. Uh, in the words of Stini, Victoria forced the theologization of the dispute. So the dispute is are we entitled to be there, kind of, in America or not? So that is like called the Duda Indiana, the doubtful, the Indian doubtful, doubt, doubt. So, so that Victoria produced this theologization of the events of the conquista was odd and unnecessary, according to Stinning, because the, one of the main doctrines of Victoria Peace, come close to me. <laughs> So uh, one of the main doctrines of Victoria is that one should always obey the civil laws. No? So why would he reframe again uh, as a theological question what had been solved by civil authorities? So this is for Stinian an open question. So to be fair, well, in any case. So however, in the introduction of the Relectio de Indies, Victoria gives his reasons, actually quite candidly, and I think it is what he says, no? He says, I'm writing about this because the issue, this issue is a question of conscience. And therefore, the theologians are, are those who possess the necessary authority to decide on this question. So the turning point in, in this lecture in, in the Indies arrives at the moment when Victoria described the status quo of the situation between Indians and Spaniards. And from there, he starts to describe the local titles of the conquista. So he depicted the nature of the relationship between Spaniards and Indians in a very striking manner. And I think you have to be questioned. It is the first quote you want to read it. So he says, amongst all nations, yes, it is considered inhuman to treat strangers and travelers badly without some special cause. Humane and beautiful to behave hospitably to strangers. It would not be lawful for the French to prohibit <coughs> Spaniards from traveling or even living in France, or vice versa, um, so long as it caused no sort of harm to themselves. Therefore, it is not lawful for the barbarians to prohibit the Spaniards from traveling to their territories either." Unquote, no? So the utopia is evident. No? He imagines the Indians during the Spanish conquista as equal members of a universal, friendly society. Famously, the critical scholar Tony Andy has written that when the Indians were included in their natural society, they became much to their disadvantage, perpetual transgressors of the laws of that natural partnership. So the first title to justify the, the presence of the Spaniards is the, se the second quote, and he says, the first just title of natural partnership and communication. My first conclusion on this point will be that the Spaniards have the right to travel and dwell in those countries so long as they do not harm to the barbarians and cannot be prevented by them from doing so. So the first idea is therefore this, the existence of that natural society among peoples and it produces two natural rights, huh? as, you, as you just read. So the right, a natural right to travel and a, a right to dwell on those places. And is it, good to, it is good to point out that Victoria, the theologian, is inventing those rights. So this is kind of the new, the, the heat of the moment. No? He invents the thing. So he was really creative, inventing this natural community and then stating that there are rights, natural rights, that arise from, those, from that natural partnership between people. Um, so, and do these natural rights come as a gift of God? Uh, so if we look at the handout, it's the third quote, he says, 
The first proof comes from the law of nations, using two, which either is or derives from natural law, as defined by the juries. What natural reason has established among all nations is called the law of nations. So apparently they don't come as a gift of God. So his theory is founded on natural reason, as he just read. No? So finally, I want to make a simple point, but nonetheless important, is that the, uh, the Indies, as we just heard, is not about the natural rights of the Indians or the natives, but about the natural rights of the Spaniards. So and I think that this fact changes quite a bit the political emancipatory value of natural rights at that moment of history, the moment of the conquest. So, uh, Grotius, he wrote around 60 years uh, later in Victoria, so he was a child prodigy, and he wrote his very important piece of international law, his first important piece, the Yuri Prede, the, the law of price and beauty when he was around 20, 24 years old. So the context of this text is probably well known, I just briefly recall it. So in 1603, the Dutch Captain Jacob van Hemskerk attacked uh, and captured uh, the Portuguese merchantman Santa Catarina in the Strait of Singapore and obtained the peaceful surrender. But uh, uh, for his luck, the price was very rich. So he, when the Carrack and his cargo were auctioned in Amsterdam in the autumn of 1604, the gross proceeds of the for the U United Amsterdam Company amounted to more than three million Dutch figures, which was a lot of money, approximately three hundred thousand pounds sterling. So, so people were thinking, hmm, is it is this a robbery or is this kind of honest what we need now, getting so much money? kind of so easily. So the, the young um, Rochus was called to defend the capture on the price. No? Uh, in the introduction of the Europrede, similarly to Victoria, Rochus defines his mission in writing an apology of the capture of the Santa Catarina also as a question of conscience, of instruct, instructing conscience. No? The historian Robert Fruit thought that Rochus was mainly addressing the Dutch pacifists among the shareholders of the East India Company. While Van Etelsum and Borschbeck extend Grotius' target to the government itself, because, mm, mm, so the state general, which was the government, so that it would help the company with the costs of waging war for having trade. And also, they state uh, the audience, the possible audience, to the generality of the Dutch merchants, so that they got more involved in the question of war, and also to the European governments at large. No? So uh, Rogers indeed writes that he will show that what has been done was honorable and that he's, a question, he's discussing the question not only for debate, whether it was right or wrong, but uh, I think this is one of the questions, this is one of the quotes, like um, the first quote on, on Rogers, he says, but since the circumstances remain unchanged, advice must be given as to whether or not the course of action already adopted is expedient for the future. So he's also given a guide for the future. So Martin van Interstone writes that the utopian aspect in Grotius, the Europrende, was the company's conviction that the seizure of the Santa Catarina heralded a brave new world, wherein the, where the the book, the Dutch company, championed the rights of the indigenous people and protected them against the Portuguese. No? So they are not saying, oh, we are robbing the Portuguese, they are saying, we are protecting the natives because the Portuguese are very bad to them. So while Victoria had devised this, this ideal order of a natural partnership between human beings, Grotius invents the ideal order of the freedom of the seas. And I'm quoting him again. No? Uh, for today, the use of the waters is common, exactly as it has been since the creation of the world. Therefore, no man has a right, nor can acquire a right about the seas, which would be prejudicial to their common use." Unquote. So this ideal order gives, among other things, uh, also natural rights. A natural right to trade and a natural right to punish those who try to monopolize the, the, the sea. So both Victoria and Grotius took it upon themselves the role of speakers of conscience. And they pointed to their audiences to reasons why their consciences needed to be illuminated further. 
So there, there is on the one hand a claim about a distant God that has decreed and made a certain ideal order of nature, the natural community, the freedom of the sea. On the other hand, there is an order of necessity that one must follow, so, or so they think. So the presence of soldiers in America, the breach of the Portuguese monopoly. So because this, this order of necessity are, is a means to attain, to attain the ideal order. And uh, this order of necessity is, is actualized through natural rights. So the pattern repeats in John Locke's work. Similarly to Victoria, rather than on titles such as granted as grant, sorry, by the king or God, Locke defends the claims of English settlers over the American land on the basis of natural rights. So this is in fact one of his originalities that distinguishes Locke from other English apologists of the colonists. So unlike Victoria Grotius, Locke is a real philosopher, at least to my humble opinion, so, and, and a real metaphysician. So this makes his ideas far more nuanced and, than those of previous writers. Locke also writes after Thomas Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes, what gives him a fair advantage in terms of depth and complexity in the employment of domestic political notions and anthropology. So the notion of human being that Locke employs is, is more theoretical and victorious and gratuitous, and therefore his theory is neater and tidier, and is kind of, you read it and you say, yes, this is it. He has, he has made it. So in this regard, Locke's work on natural rights is a refinement of previous theories. While he is also embracing the fundamental elements of the 16th and 17th pro-colonial theory of natural rights, this, that I have described so far. So, um, moreover, also natural rights perform exactly the same function in his argument that they, they did in Victorian Grotius. So, in Locke's case, the ideal order is the state of nature. So. The, the ideal order of uh, Locke, the, the ideal order of the state of nature, is one of perfect freedom and perfect equality among individuals. So that's to the inter international universal society that Victoria had kind of invented, and the international freedom of the seas of Grotius. Now the international state of nature is added to the theory of natural rights. And uh, so Barbara Arnett's book. John Locke and America, the defense of English colonialism, shows that the two treatises of government, with, so one of the main reasons to write the two treatises of government was a defense of England's colonial policy. So the disposition of the Aboriginal peoples in the New World against the skeptics in England. So again, like the same pattern. And the counterclaims of both the Aboriginal nations and other European powers in America. So, um, um, so he follows the majority of the theological tradition and refutes Robert Firman and says that uh, in the in this equalitarian state of nature, everything is common. So all the things are common, and this common property in the state of nature famously uh, becomes private uh, through the right of property that every individual uh, can actually do her labor. So we, we I write, uh, sorry, I work in a place, and so the place becomes mine. I have put my person in this place. No? So common property becomes uh, private property, as you probably know here, not much better than, than I do. So, uh, but even more famously, in places where there is no common government, uh, no money or commerce, that is in territories with the state of nature conditions as America, and quoting, cultivating the earth and having dominion, we see our joint together, unquote. So, um, it is after all the right to travel, dwell, and trade what makes real, victorious natural society. And in Grotius understanding, it is the right to trade and to punish that actualizes the freedom of the seas. And similarly, uh, through um, the unnatural right to private property through one's labor, it is, is made real the commonality of the state of nature. So the utopian story that Locke tells is about the civilization of the ways of working, 
of the Amerindians. Transforming them from hunters, like the, civil, the savage way, sorry, into farmers, which is the civilized way. No? So it was the utopia because apparently, as historians tell us, it did not describe the Amerindians as they were, but as it suited his theory for supporting colonialism. So, for instance, Wilcom Washburn and other people have written, and also it is depicted in, in pictures, in drawings from the 16th and 17th century, uh, that uh, Amerindians were both hunters, but probably more importantly also agriculturalists and fishermen. So, I finish here with two conclusions. Um, one first tentative conclusion is that in the 16th and 17th century, with the instruments of natural rights, uh, a new law of nations is created that helps to justify the particular form of expansion of European empires. Not only justify it in front of the natives of the future colonies, but also in front of the Europeans, so amongst themselves. Huh? And the second conclusion is methodological, so um, I think it is uh, useful to produce an analytical study of the notions and uses of natural rights uh, because it shows that natural rights cross borders of nations and divisions of religions, Catholic Protestants. So I have, uh, I have described these uh, elements like the ideal order, the utopian aspects and also the, the natural right that can actually embodies the, the realist need of political action. So, so as, well, as I said, so the natural rights cross borders, the concept of natural rights cross borders and nations and religions. So, so in that sense, the history of natural law, which is what I'm trying to do, is not simply a historical succession of different understandings depending on which author, which nation, which religion, but there is also a consistent attempt that crosses kind of over all these countries, there is a consistent attempt to produce order through natural rights within the, the messy business of the expanding uh, European empires. So at least what I have to say, actually. <laughs>
And there's people who suddenly want to go into the natural law tradition to resuscitate it against the positivists. Mm. James Brown Scott or, or La Trapa. So I guess what I'm, what I'm wondering, just in your feeling, if the, if the natural versus positive law thing is a 20th century, it has a, it, it's expressed in the 20th century in a certain way, but we don't see it from, let's say, 1830 to 1900, really. Uh, why was it that suddenly in the 20th century for you, I, this is, I don't know if you, but why in the 20th century did it suddenly come up as an important way of thinking about things when for 70 years it just had sort of, it wasn't the way that people understood the tradition, you know, they would talk about Grotius and Gentili and, and all these people, but they would think of them in a different light. Hmm. So why the 20th century did natural law become the natural law that we think of it today in its juxtapositions? Yes, if I could answer that question, I would be a million. <laughs> yeah, right. but, but it's true, there are several things that, that for instance, um, I don't know if you know the work of Milos Beck, but he, he makes an argument that, that really natural law was very active in the 19th century. Mm. This is what he... Uh, but I understand what you say, that it's more about history and... and so you don't, and, and it's true that in this, art, this very famous article of Lars Oppenheim in the, I think, 1908 or so, in the American Journal of International Law, the Science of International Law, is the title. No, sorry. What is it? I, well, I think it is something about, sorry, I don't remember now the title, but it is about the Science of International Law. And uh, it is there where he says, no more natural law, please. So, fossil and uh, Muslim. And um, yes, so I think um, why I don't know, but but there is a clear uh, wish to 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 really forget about. But of course, he has. I think he has a, his own natural law mm. with other. So for the natural law for him is, but so different from the natural law from Grotius, of course. No? But so he has this his own particular. I would say now natural law to, to refer to, to giving a substance to what is important, so to say, on, on what does the positive law ground. He says no, now the natural law or the positive law doesn't need any ground, but he's giving his own substance, as you know from my book, yeah. on the economy. He says now the, the substance that unites us is our common interest. So, and I would call this is a kind of a new natural law. So that's why he wants to get rid of uh, weird things. But at the end of the day, I think they are very similar. <laughs> only, only, well, yes, this is what I I wonder if this came about because of the rise of Mormonism and the kind of, the, like the, not the death of religious belief, but challenges to religious belief. Um. And also, you know, coupled with the increased complexity of societies. You know, if you were, I yeah, they say, they, they say, I would say the early 19th century, you know, you really didn't need much law. You know, you, you needed the basic things, you know, regarding property, family, and crime. You know, once, you know, once you've got a, 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 an increased economy, that's not enough. I think the, the, the interesting thing about, about the, Four major works that you, or uh, figures that you came up with. Yes, they're all talking about natural rights, but none of them were disinterested. It was all not, natural rights for a specific reason, mm -hmm. which might seem to undercut the apparent, object, the apparent objectivity which they claim. Yes, 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 totally. They are not objective. I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I think the logic box book on human rights is one of these weakest. What do you mean? Sorry? I think it's one of his weakest. You know, it doesn't have the depth of some of his other writings. No. And I mean, I mean, the kind of first bit is really just a fairly superficial overview of various theories. I mean, I think the important bit in that book is actually the impact it had on the drafting of the European Convention on Human Rights, because he did set up a mechanism. Uh, or you know, for the protection of human rights, which came, became influential in the European Convention mechanisms 
first bit, no. I really don't read it. No. That's all I wanted to say. Mm. Very interesting. So you like the 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 four the four theologians or the Victoria Grotius? Victoria, I've not read much. Um, yeah, I've read the books a long time ago. Grotius, I think, is more interesting because I mean, he is really where you get the move towards consent as a basis for introduction. Well, he's very clean on that. Um, and then we can go. I can't remember the phrase, but it's something like that. The um, um, you know, the, the, you know, you know, propositions which are true, even if you know we said to the utmost wickedness and said that God didn't exist. Yes, I can't yes, remember the, 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 yeah, I can't remember the precise, precise phrase, but there is there the move towards consent. But again, it really is tied into the need for the need for trade, especially in our labour. Yeah. That is, I mean, that was a brief written for the Dutch East India Company. Yes. There is no way that that is objective. Yes, but, uh, yes, I don't think any, no one is objective, I think, actually, because in doing theory, no? I'm not objective. No, no, I, mean, <laughs> I, I, think, I think these works were, were written with specific... Yes, political work, yes. Yeah. Yes, but also, for instance, the, the, in the Indies, Victoria finishes, like, the last, almost the last sentences of, of the Indies is, but whatever happens, if what I have said is not convincing, more or less, the trade cannot stop. Mm -hmm. so, so there is also, I mean, you know, in, in, in all the okay. It's the, the, the history you've given is obviously international in focus, which, I mean, obviously makes sense from the context we're talking about this in, but were the ways that natural rights were articulated always, were they only coming from a sort of international viewpoint, I guess? So you connected. Locked to Hobbes, but obviously Hobbes is not necessarily writing about imperialism or um, foreign territory acquisition. So then, is there something about the domestic politics that also influences how certain versions of natural rights appear? Mm -hmm. And how do you maybe square those two things together? Because yes, very nice. Thank you. This is a wonderful question, uh, and, and I, I don't have an answer yet. I actually uh, Hobbes is, is of, of course I have read a lot of Hobbes, but in a different project, so I have to put my head. On Hobbes and this, my my immediate sense was Hobbes was that he is the only one that is kind of honest with the with the um, ideal order. But his his feeling is that the ideal order is not ideal at all. It's horrible. No? Like this is his state of nature. It's horrible. So he kind of is more uniting both the ideal order and the the realist order. And. Um, so and and I think, of course, you you know what was happening in England. So it's it's kind of a, a, a civil war state here when he's writing. So perhaps this has something to do with how he used natural rights, but I'm not sure. But my my uh, first uh, my start of the in this project is the 13th century theologians that they are not using them internationally at all. So they, these are discussions of. Power within the church, actually, and also with, between the church and the state in France. So, but um, uh, yes, so yes, in perhaps in this period that I have mentioned, art is more internationally used, but they had other more domestic uh, uses. I think, especially the, the characteristic is that they are uh, used to create a new morality, a new type of morality. That can be applied within the state, or against the church, or for the church, or so depends on the context. That's really it. so. Where can we go? can we close this off and then we'll uh, meet in the back of the room? Wonderful. Thank you again, Monica. Thank you.